Hi, this is Dr. Richard Bernstein, uh, proprietor of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. Uh, you can see our free videos on the World Wide Web, also called the Internet, uh, through your search engine or by going to YouTube. Um, I'm going to talk today about 19 important facts that your doctor probably does not know. Uh, the first one relates to target blood sugars for type 1 diabetics. Uh, the American Diabetes Association currently recommends that type 1 diabetics uh, keep their blood sugars in a range from 70 milligrams per deciliter to 180 milligrams per deciliter 70 percent of the time and they can go beyond this range uh, 30 percent of the time well that means that uh, they're recommending a, a diabetic uh, should have can have a blood sugar of 179 which uh, about 70 percent of the time and go about that the, above that or below it much below uh, 70 the rest of the time now a normal blood sugar for an adult is about 83 milligrams per deciliter which most doctors do not realize and normal blood sugars for kids uh, early uh, preteens and early teens would be 65 to 75 milligrams per deciliter based upon the blood sugars of slim non-diabetic children from families that do not have diabetes. Item number two on our list, glucose is toxic to beta cells. I neglected to mention in number one that with such high blood sugars recommended by the American Diabetes Association, uh, these uh, type 1 diabetics are certain to get long-term complications of diabetes. Uh, and this has been shown over and over. Uh, glucose is toxic to beta cells. Uh, doctors are frequently recommending uh, to newly diagnosed diabetics that uh, especially those that require insulin type 1 diabetics they tell them uh, if their blood sugars are reasonably mild or fitting the ADA guidelines you don't need insulin until you burn out all your beta cells so let's just burn out your beta cells and uh, when they're all gone we'll prescribe insulin now it happens that it's a lot easier to keep blood sugars normal if you're making insulin and over the years I've seen many diabetics including one I've been treating since 1985 who uh, we gave normal blood sugars to with the help of diet and um, multiple insulin doses uh, and with the normal blood sugars more beta cells did not get burned out uh, the doctors call this a honeymoon period when they are still making insulin and we preserved the honeymoon period but by advocating high blood sugars and withholding insulin until all the beta cells are destroyed is just the opposite of what you should be doing you should be bending over backwards to preserve beta cells because it's so much easier to uh, treat your diabetes to keep your blood sugars normal if you're making insulin so i covered our third topic is the, that we can prolong the honeymoon period uh, the fourth the 
long-term complications of diabetes are not a coin toss as is advocated by many doctors, um, especially some endocrinologists tell their patients that it's just a coin toss whether you're going to get go blind or get kidney disease or have an early heart attack. Um, they don't tell the patient that the complications of diabetes are related to a product of blood sugar times time. The longer you have, the more years you have high blood sugars, the more likely you're going to develop the long-term complications of diabetes. Um, so that's a fiction that it's just a matter of chance. The next fact, number five, that many doctors do not are not aware of is that starting after about three months of pregnancy, that's called the first trimester, possibly even earlier, blood sugars in, in normal non-diabetic women tend to be lower than the non-pregnancy blood sugars, uh, typically around 65 milligram per deciliter versus the, let's say, 83 milligram per deciliter in um, non-obese, non-overeating, uh, non-diabetic women. Uh, so it should be a, a guide to diabetic women to match the blood sugars of non-diabetic women and, of course, not have severe hypoglycemia. Uh, again, uh, helps would be uh, my book, Diabetes Solution, and also uh, watching the videos in Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. But um, blood sugars should be as close to those of non-diabetic women as possible, and that's in the vicinity of 65 milligram per deciliter once pregnancy has really go gone underway. Another myth that has been perpetuated for years by the American Diabetes Association is that there is subcutaneous fat on the anterior or front of your thighs and on the side of your thighs. And they, for years, have been publishing pictures of kids giving themselves injections of insulin uh, in their thighs. Well, this would be okay if you want to give an intramuscular shot, uh, which will make the insulin work much faster. But the ADA is recommending this for all insulins and the long acting insulins, you want to last as long as possible, not be sped up uh, and made as rapidly as possible. Uh, so you certainly should not inject long acting insulin into your thighs. And uh, if you're uh, having low carbohydrate meals, you certainly should not uh, be injecting your mealtime insulin into your thighs because the insulin will work faster than the food. So yet another myth. Number uh, seven, gastroparesis, which is a paralysis of the, of the uh, stomach and digestive system, uh, which by the way, can be mild to severe in diabetes, is almost universal in long-standing diabetes, whether it's type one or type two. Um, and doctors don't realize this. When they're attempting to control blood sugars, uh, especially with the help of uh, insulin and diet, they don't take into account the fact that this particular patient may have gastroparesis. 
um, mild cases uh, will just show low blood sugars after some meals and higher blood sugars many hours later when the food's finally digested. Um, in severe gastroparesis, which is quite rare, uh, the patient may be vomiting all day long. I call that end-stage gastroparesis. The next um, lack of information has to do with how do you diagnose gastroparesis. The conventional wisdom is to have the patient take a gastric emptying study where they um, uh, swallow uh, a meal, usually it's eggs, uh, spiked with um, a radioactive substance. Uh, it used to be technetium, I don't know what they're currently using. And a gamma ray image is taken of the uh, stomach and digestive system every half hour or so to see how far this radioactive meal has moved in the GI tract. Now, it happens that gastroparesis, the hallmark of gastroparesis, is its unpredictability. One day, you may have normal stomach emptying. Another day, it, it may be at a standstill. And this is the milder the gastroparesis, the more intermittent or uncertain it is. Uh, in my experience with patients who were given gastric em emptying studies in the days when it was experimental and the uh, investigator uh, got funded by, uh, by the government uh, to do multiple studies on the same person, we typically would have to do four studies before we got one abnormal one even though uh, the blood sugar data showed um, that the patient had gastroparesis. Um, I eventually went to a more reliable study, which is called the RR interval study, which is a test for autonomic neuropathy in general uh, and measures uh, changes in the heart rate with deep breathing and uh, this variation of heart rate can be impaired if you have autonomic neuropathy, as can gastroparesis. So this is a natural test for gastroparesis, but the powers that be are not recommending it. The gastroenterologists who know about it don't even talk about it, and most gastroenterologists don't even know about it. the fact that should be obvious but isn't, that carbohydrate is not the only dietary uh, element that raises blood sugar. Here we have um, many type 1 diabetics being told to base their mealtime insulin dose on the amount of carbohydrate they're eating and ignore all the other elements of the meal with a net result, of course, that most type 1 diabetics do not have uh, consistent or normal blood sugars after meals. Um, uh, we know the, the reason that carbohydrate is not the only element that affects blood sugar, main reason is the production of hormones by the intestines whenever you eat a meal. And the elements of a meal that cause the production of these hormones, principal, the most studied one is called GLP-1. Uh, the elements that affect the secretion of GLP-1 are carbohydrate, fat, protein, and bulk. The bigger the size of the meal, no matter what it's made of, the more GLP-1 you're going to produce. 
and GLP-1 has a variety of effects upon blood sugar. Um, so if you take, if you took a non-diabetic and had him eat a handful of pebbles, he would make enough insulin to offset some of the effects of the GLP-1 that uh, his blood sugar wouldn't go up. But you take a diabetic who cannot make insulin and feed him a handful of pebbles, just the distension of the digestive tract from the pebbles will raise his blood sugar. Number eight. Weight loss ketosis, which is uh, similar to fasting ketosis, is not diabetic ketoacidosis. We have uh, the uh, confusion that permeates the medical profession probably came about with Dr. Robert Atkins many years ago, uh, I believe back in the uh, late 60s, maybe even late 50s, where he uh, was telling people who were on low carbohydrate diets to test their urine for ketones to see if they're losing weight, see if they're digesting fat. Ketones are a byproduct of the digestion of fat. And if you're metabolizing your body fat, you're going to make ketones. Well, <laughs> he got into trouble with the rest of the medical profession because they thought that um, fasting or uh, dietary uh, uh, weight loss ketosis was equivalent to diabetic ketoacidosis, which it wasn't. And uh, if I had been Atkins, I would have told people to have a scale and see to see if they're losing weight, not to test their urine for ketones. Um, so that started a wave of terror if you ever had ketones in your urine. And of course, um, when people uh, are not even are not eating overnight, uh, many uh, people when they wake up in the morning have ketones in their urine. Um, uh, when there's a famine, you're certainly going to have ketones in your urine if you're not eating. And that is not diabetic ketoacidosis. It's uh, a way by which humans survived famine because the brain can live off of ketones. And that's how they uh, kept their brains alive in the old days when there were frequent famines. Number nine, humans need protein. There are many people taking diets, uh, especially those who like the ketone diets, because uh, they think that it's going to be more healthy. And in order to have uh, show ketones in your blood or your urine, you have to um, be metabolizing a lot of fat to show the high ketones many of these people want. And to do that, you not only have to cut way back or eliminate carbohydrate, which gets metabolized first before the fat, but you also have to eliminate protein because protein can get converted to carbohydrate by the liver if there's not enough glucose around. So um, these people are being deprived of protein in order to raise the ketones in the urine, and they need protein for many functions of the body. Um, many hormones are called peptide hormones, which means change of amino acids, and the amino acids are derived from uh, proteins which are made of amino acids. Uh, there's muscle mass, 
which will deteriorate. Uh, that's made of protein. So there are many substances that are probably protein neurotransmitters. Um, so the body needs protein. And if you're going to put them on a diet that really shows a lot of ketones in the urine, you're uh, likely to be depriving them of proteins. And indeed, uh, many of these people who have come to see me as patients, when in spite of their um, uh, low carbohydrate diet, they still had high blood sugars, uh, they were following these uh, keto diets, not getting enough protein, and they were in pretty sad shape. The next item on our list is the dawn phenomenon. The dawn phenomenon is uh, a situation that affects diabetics but not non-diabetics where uh, they may wake up, go to sleep with a normal blood sugar and wake up in the morning with an elevated blood sugar or at their usual wake up time their blood sugar is okay but an hour or two later it may have gone up even though they did not eat any breakfast. Now, uh, doctors, especially endocrinologists, have invented all kinds of explanations for why this occurs. And all of the explanations but one are um, fantasies. The one true explanation I have never heard from a physician or seen on the internet. And uh, how do I know about it? Because I've been reading the scientific literature since I got out of medical school, which was in 1983. And uh, back around 1985, a study was done of the dawn phenomenon. And they did it on diabetics and whoever thought of the study was a pretty, I don't remember who it was, was, a pretty smart person. He speculated that because people make growth hormone in the middle of the night, that maybe the growth hormone uh, had to do with the dawn phenomenon. And what they did was they measured the clearance of insulin in the bloodstream on awakening in the morning on patient, the patients given anti-growth hormone, somatostatin, that prevents the pituitary from making growth hormone. And they also had the same patients on other days not receive the somatostatin. And when they received the somatostatin, these are diabetics, when they received the somatostatin, their blood sugar went up in the morning. When they didn't receive it, their blood sugar, uh, I'm sorry, when they received the somatostatin, their blood sugars did not go up. And when they did not receive the somatostatin, their blood sugars went up. So they proved conclusively that growth hormone is the culprit in uh, overnight blood sugar rise. And what they found was that uh, people, even people who are not growing, uh, uh, mature adults, make a peak of growth hormone about three hours after they go to sleep. And that um, growth hormone causes the liver to have metabolic changes that take uh, maybe five, four or five hours to occur where the liver is clearing away insulin. Now, in a non-diabetic, a non-diabetic can make at least three times as much insulin as they'll ever need. Diabetics, however, have injected their long-acting insulin at bedtime, and it's being trickled into their bloodstream in small amounts overnight. And as 
this slow insulin infusion occurs in the early morning, the liver is able to clear most of it away so that blood sugars go up. Next has to do with insulin pens. If you have are using an insulin pen, it would be wise to take a look, actually take a feel for your injection site after you give a shot. You give the shot and pull the needle out, wipe the site with your hand, and you'll feel that it's wet. Sometimes if you look at the tip of the needle from the pen after the injection, you'll see a drop on the needle. The pens cause leakage from the injection site. It probably has to do with the fact that you're transmitting the pressure of your finger through a secondary system that uh, reduces the velocity of the insulin outflow. If you were to take a syringe with insulin in it and push it hard with your finger, you might squirt the insulin several feet. Whereas if you do it with a pen, you might get it to squirt two or three inches. It's not coming out with enough velocity to remain under the skin and it's too close to the surface and it leaks out. You can try the experiment I just mentioned and you'll see that it's valid. What I've found is that um, smaller doses are more likely uh, to leak than larger doses. But I should say will we'll leak a greater percent than larger doses. Uh, another fact that doctors don't know is the half-life of insulin in your bloodstream. Um, you might ask your doctor if he were to inject insulin into your vein, how long would it be detectable in, the, in your blood? And there'll be speculation because they have no idea. And the real, the real truth, uh, which has been studied and reported, but doctors don't read the research literature, uh, is that insulin has a half-life in the blood of six and a half minutes. So if you inject 10 units in, into a vein, in six and a half minutes, there will be only five units detectable in the blood. Um, and uh, in five half-lives, there'll be none detectable in the blood. Now, what actually happens is perhaps 10% of the injected insulin finds receptors uh, on cells throughout the body on which the insulin acts and binds the receptors early on. And it takes a while once insulin has hit a receptor for the insulin to do its job, which is to bring glucose into the cell. Um, so early on, the insulin gets bound, but takes a long while to have its effect. And in the meanwhile, the concentration in the blood is being cleared away by the liver quite rapidly, half-life six and a half minutes. The remaining subjects for this little talk are the musculoskeletal complications of diabetes, uh, some of which I'll mention, but there are many. And most doctors are unaware of this. Um, a couple of them I discovered and reported on many years ago, and um, they all involve glycation of collagen. Collagen is possibly the longest lived protein in the body. In a 21 year old non-diabetic healthy person, um, the collagen in their body probably uh, lasts about 15 years, maybe longer. 
And if you glycate collagen, the collagen uh, um, usually appears in connective tissue uh, as fibers. And these fibers are interlocked with one another. Um, they can slide so that um, a tendon can stretch and contract. But if you glycate the fibers, the glucose that's stuck to the collagen fibers acts as a glue. And when you try to move them, you're going to tear them apart because they've been glued together. And that torn collagen fibers, uh, th that tearing causes inflammation, pain, and um, a restriction of range of motion. So the first of these musculoskeletal changes would be frozen shoulder. Um, you'll find that many diabetics uh, have one or two shoulders that have limited range of motion. They may have trouble putting on a t-shirt, uh, trouble uh, abducting their arm, raising the arm so it points over their head. Most commonly, uh, difficulty on internal rotation. That is, if you stick your hand behind your back, uh, try to touch your spine, and then move your hand as high up your back as possible, um, the diabetics will not be able to move it very far if they've had diabetes for uh, many years. Um, and it might even be painful when they try to move their hand. Uh, when I had this problem, which was uh, before I learned how to control my blood sugars, um, I could not reach in the back seat of my car to grab something, or I could not, I uh, had, uh, I needed help putting on a t-shirt. Um, a treatment for the frozen shoulder is what's called trigger point massage, where you find these little knots or hard spots of glycated collagen uh, along the um, uh, upper arm, uh, could go all the way to the neck, and um, a strong massage, perhaps with a uh, uh, electric massaging tool, uh, helps relieve the um, uh, the problem. Um, many orthopedists are injecting these trigger points with steroids which will raise the blood sugar uh, for a number of weeks, relieve the pain temporarily, uh, but eventually the uh, situation gets worse. So trigger point massage is the treatment. Uh, next is Dupuytren's contracture, which is a flexion of the fingers of the hand Usually it starts with the fourth finger. In some people, it's only the fourth finger. In extreme cases, the whole hand acts as a claw, claw hand. Um, there frequently is a lump on the flexor tendon. There are flexor tendons on your fingers, at the base of your fingers, going down the palm. And there could be lumps on the flexor tendon, lumps of glycated collagen. And um, one treatment that I've used for this uh, is a mixture of collagenase, which is an enzyme that breaks down collagen, and DMSO, which is a solvent that carries the enzyme through the skin into the collagen uh, in the fiber. Um, there are some hand surgeons who actually give collagenase injections. And these may be covered by uh, insurance. Uh, the injections are usually very painful and they have to be given 
uh, multiple times. So um, if the uh, collagenase uh, DMSO mixture works, you apply it maybe four times a day and it's not painful and it's a lot less expensive. Um, but you have to find someone to um, prescribe the collagenase. Collagenase is a costly product. Next is carpal tunnel syndrome. The there's a band around the wrist that everyone has called the carpal band that protects the nerves and muscles going from the upper arm to the hand and it protects them from injury. But this band is made of collagen and it can get glycated and when it's glycated it can thicken and can press on the nerves and uh, uh, vessels that pass through this carpal tunnel. And that can uh, give um, loss of sensation or even pain in the palm of the hand and uh, weakness. So you'll find these people may have a weak grip. Um, uh, uh, one test is to put a piece of paper between the thumb and the first finger or the second finger and have the patient press on the paper and the doctor pulls it out. And if you have uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, it'll be very easy to pull the paper out. Uh, other people may find it uh, that they're weak when they try to hold a cup of tea or coffee that uh, it that it it's too heavy to hold. Uh, so there are a number of sy symptoms. Um, uh, there are certain professions that will exas exacerbate uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, like uh, in the old days was operating a cash register. Now it could be typing on your computer. So if you have high blood sugars and you're typing on the computer, um, you're subject to possible carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, I never had carpal tunnel syndrome, but I'm certainly fearful of it because uh, you could get it just from typing for your computer. So here's a wrist pad that I use with my computer uh, to keep the pressure off the carpal band. Off the, yes, off the carpal band. Um, Next is um, iliotibial band tensor fasciolata syndrome. The iliotibial band is a strip of connective tissue like tendon that goes from the lateral hip up near the butt down to the knee. And there may be trigger points along the iliotibial band. Uh, there may be pain. It may be, you may have difficulty walking. Um, uh, frequently people will have uh, difficulty operating a car with the leg that has the ITB syndrome. Um, sometimes they'll use the affected leg for the gas pedal and the other leg to step on the brake, uh, where most people use the same leg for both. Um, the iliotibial band is connected to more collagen on the rear part of the hip, so called the tensor fasciolata, and we call it TFL-ITB syndrome because the two are connected and frequently uh, people have this whole big strip going back from the back of the butt down to the knee. Um, sometimes they call it um, sciatica or the doctor calls it sciatica, but if it doesn't go down to the foot, it does not involve the sciatic nerve, so it's not sciatica. It's ITBTFL. And um, 
what I find found as a treatment for ITB TFL is vacuum stretching, where we get a little vacuum pump and we have a plexiglass cup connected to the pump. We lubricate the ITB TFL so that you could comfortably move this suction cup along this whole strip, stretching it. And it's uncomfortable with a suction that's actually stretching uh, and breaking uh, glycated collagen, uh, but it works. However, if you continue to have high blood sugars, it's going to come back. So the game plan is to normalize blood for all these things, is to normalize blood sugar and uh, also do the treatment. Uh, last on our list is Peroni's disease. Peroni's disease is an abnormality of the erect penis where it points off center. And uh, you may have heard about this in the news if you're old enough, because we had a president of the United States who was involved with a female intern who reported uh, to a reporter that his penis pointed to the side when erect. And uh, when I heard that in the news, I said to myself and to my friends, this guy has diabetes. And sure enough, uh, a few months or maybe it was a year later, uh, he was hospitalized at a young age for a heart attack. And I believe that he had a coronary artery bypass graft. Um, now, what would the, what would the treatment be? Uh, I've never had, uh, an opportunity to treat it. I only had one patient with this condition, although it's well described in the literature. It has to do with a collagen band that doesn't go all the way around the penis. That's sort of off center and it pulls the penis in one direction uh, because uh, it, it uh, because this tight band is pulling. Um, I imagine that the collagenase DMSO treatment might work. I've never tried it, but um, it certainly would be worth trying. Um, there are many other gems like the ones I've just disclosed on Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. Again, you could find it on the World Wide Web. Uh, you use your search engine, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University, and you can certainly read my book, Diabetes Solution, which tells how to normalize blood sugar. Thanks for watching.